Okay, good evening, everybody. Dr. Blumenstein, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dave. All right, fantastic. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar this evening. My name is Dave Taylor from Reichert. Uh, the audience numbers are going up dramatically as we speak here, so I'm just going to wait one or two more minutes while people are joining the call. Um, just uh, sit tight, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome, everybody. Again, our webinar this evening is uh, Improve Efficiency at a Distance with Digital Refraction. My name is Dave Taylor. I'm a, a Director of uh, Product Development at Rikert and uh, Business Development at Rikert. I've been with the company for 20-some years, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Blumenstein for, what, about 12 of those years, Dr. Blumenstein? Got at least. Yeah. Maybe more, yeah, maybe 15. So I think I had hair. I think I had hair when you actually yeah. knew me. So Well, I'm uh, I'm starting to emulate your hairstyle these days. So, mm -hmm. uh, so tonight we're going to talk about the changing landscape of refraction. We're going to talk about digital refraction features and benefits and spend a little time talking about telerefraction. Um, I, at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll talk specifically a little bit about our Rikert for Opter VRX and something called uh, digital optometrics that Dr. Blumenstein will also touch on. And we'll have a Q&A session. So a little bit of housekeeping stuff here on the, on the panel of your uh, GoToWebinar uh, controls. You'll see um, probably the ability to type in some questions. That's our preferred method to ask questions. Um, so if you do have a question, go ahead and type it in. I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar and um, I'll read those questions to Dr. Blumenstein to answer when, when appropriate. We're gonna have a couple audience polls tonight. So um, during particular parts of the presentation, I'll launch a poll and you'll get to vote on the answers. That's always fun and interactive part of the presentation. Um, there's also a couple of handouts that you can access on your control panel too, some PDFs and things that you can download that hopefully will be interesting and useful to you. Um, so that's about it. Uh, let's get going here. Uh, oh, and don't forget to take our survey after the presentation's over. We're going to ask you what you liked, what you disliked, and those sorts of things so we can do better next time. Uh, Dr. Mark Blumenstein graduated from the New England College of Optometry back in 1994 when Pearl Jam and Nirvana were still cool. Um, he finished his residency in secondary ophthalmic care at Barnett Delaney Eye Care Center in Phoenix, Arizona received a fellowship from the Academy of Optometry in 98, and is one of the founding members of the Optometric Council on Refractive Technology, practicing at Schwartz Laser Eye Center in Arizona, and is on the editorial board of Primary Care of Optometry and Contemporary Optometry, and above and beyond all those things is a great and cool guy. So mm. Dr. Blumenstein, here's where you step in. I'm going to, um, if I have mastery of all this technology, turn the controls over to you so that you can advance the slides. Okay. We'll see how we do. Let's see how you know, we it's, do. It's, it's, it's really funny too, when you just step back 1994, in COVID years, that's like two weeks, two right. weeks ago, pretty exactly. much, yeah. You know, the other thing, too, that's kind of interesting is this morning I was presenting a poster for the American Academy of Optometry. Because for those of you, I mean, the Academy was supposed to be having their meeting this year, I think, was at Nashville like right. right now. So, Dave, we would have been in Nashville and some of your attendees were. And so it was a virtual poster session. Now, if you've ever gone to the poster sessions, um, it was pretty much the same thing. It was pretty quiet on the yeah. virtual session. So yeah, that was pretty much it. Well, hopefully so. you picked up on some fantastic new science in the virtual poster yeah. session. Hey, so I was I'm there. Gonna, yeah. I'm going to turn my camera off so as not to distract people from your beautiful face. And um, you now should have control of the slides, Dr. Blumenstein. I do. Thanks, Dave. You know, it, this is kind of a timely uh, webinar, if you will. And why I say timely is because everything is changing. I mean, what, one of my favorite sayings that I never want to ever hear uttered from my mouth is the new normal. I mean, if I hear the new normal one more time, then I just, I, I want to hit myself because everything is just not normal. It's just abnormal, but this is where we are moving forward. And the interesting thing too, is that we've kind of been thrust into this, but this is how we practice optometry and especially how we achieve a person's prescription 
has something that's been evolving through the years. You know, this this landscape of refraction has kind of changed partially because technology, but also partially because we've been pushed into it a little bit. You know, one of the challenges was that online retailers continue to commoditize the refraction when the reality is that we all know that the ability to discern and differentiate your patient's refractions is, is a skill. It's something that, you know, the acumen that we developed through the years and through working with our patients is, is definitely a skill. So, you know, one of the things I feel that we need to do, and there's an opportunity here, is to differentiate through personalized experience. You know, we start thinking about, you know, independent practices uh, can find a niche by basically creating this difference from some of these larger chains or bigger boxes uh, of doctors. You know, COVID-19 has really accelerated uh, teleoptometry, and we'll talk about that. And, you know, through the last, I don't know, probably five years or longer, I've been uh, fortunate enough to kind of see what's on the horizon. And one of those things is really working remotely. I mean, we can achieve some of the exact same things that we do when we're in front of a patient as we can doing it away from a patient. And I always just kind of envision the ability for us to be able to kind of uh, manage our patients from afar. You know, somebody who is, you know, on a trip in Paris and they, they lose their glasses or contacts, that we might be able to kind of achieve the same thing as if they were sitting in our chair. So we can see this convenience and flexibility that, that telehealth is providing us. And more importantly, you know, people don't want to come out. I mean, I think of one thing we've kind of realized with COVID too, is this, that there is a little bit of a scare factor. You know, I mean, when we uh, kind of started quarantining here in Arizona, um, it, was, it was hardcore. When we opened up, we opened up very slowly, and the vast majority of our patients um, were really happy with the notion that we started offering them the opportunity to have a telehealth visit, um, to maximize their um, interactions with us, whether it be via webinar, whether it be on a telephone call. Um, but one of the things that, that was asked is, is there a way you could just do this without me having to come in? And so maximizing refraction efficiency, focusing on medical eye care, but kind of doing it in a manner that makes it kind of, I guess, faster and better for our patients. So when we think of this landscape, to me, it's like the, the root of optometry is refractions. And so to me, it's like, how do we make refractions better? Well, let's look, oh, too fast. Let's look at refractions. Okay, the manual of Ferropter, and what's interesting to me is, you know, Ferropter is a trademark name, uh, and it's trademarked, I believe, uh, from uh, our good friends up there in Rochester. And this has been the standard for 90 years. Think about that. We are sitting in here, okay, all of us staring at a, a, a piece of equipment and talking to each other across the country. Clearly, we're visualizing the same things. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys are thinking about getting the iPhone 12, which is, you know, I guess coming out in October, when the reality is, is that if you're telling me you're still using a Ferropter, still thinking about which is better, one or two, a device that we've been using for 90 years. I mean, digital Ferropters, yeah, they're a little bit more of an investment for the practice. But to me, one of the things that I, and I'll talk about my experience, my experience has been that they, they make my time in the lane faster. They make my time in the lane more efficient. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do is we actually see our patients noticing a difference between, you know, their old prescription and their new prescription and basically wanting to basically move into the optical and, and, and purchase that, that upgraded prescription. You know, so I think the ROI on there is, is absolutely um, impressive. You know, when I said that for about 90 years, you know, patients walk into our practice and they're, they're impressed by the fact that look at all this equipment you have. You know, we've, we've been fortunate enough, we use a lot of Rikert equipment, whether it be an ORA or whether it be the auto lensometer or the auto refractor, um, but we are auto um, uh, lensometer and yeah, the auto refractor as well as using a auto ferropter. So we differentiate ourselves by that, by patients walking in. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, in a cataract and refractive surgery center, we also do primary eye care. And when patients come into our practice, there's a perception 
that we're doing something different than other clinics. And part of that perception is reality. We're the official eye center of the Phoenix Suns. You can see the jersey up there, the Coyotes, uh, as well as the Diamondbacks. And a lot of patients come in thinking, oh, well, if it's good enough for those guys, then it's absolutely got to be good enough for me. But one of the things that they walk out the, the, the door saying is that was the most thorough evaluation I've had, or I really felt like you guys are, are kind of on cutting edge because of the equipment that you used to garner you know, the, the diagnosis that we did. You know, the thing that's been kind of exciting for me, and, and you know, I do this silly kind of uh, um, uh, video series. I used to do a blog, uh, so it's a vlog. And for the last year, what I've done is really kind of like focused on how COVID has changed things for us. And I'll, I'll kind of show you an example of that, you know, as we move on with this uh, presentation. But, you know, coming in and being able to distance ourselves. And if you think about it, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys, you know, pick up an ophthalmoscope and get on top of your patients these days. I mean, honestly, I, I, if I did that right now, I feel like patients would be like, whoa, whoa, step off. What are you doing? You know, we clean our rooms really thoroughly. We are very active in making sure our patients know that. And we do a really great job of social distancing, keeping that six feet, which the CDC recommends. So especially during those times in the lanes where we can stay at a distance, then we're absolutely going to do that. Dave, I think you've got a, a poll question coming up yep, right now, don't you? Yep, this is our first opportunity to try the poll question. So I'm going to activate a poll here. All of the attendees should see this on their screen, and you can vote. Uh, have you implemented social distancing guidelines in your practice? So far, we've got 100% yes, 98% yes, either... You know, there's who's the people. one who's that one person not doing it come on i think they're in uh, 2019 still yeah all right so it's at it's settled in at 98 percent yes so i think uh, overwhelmingly the audience has spoken they're doing social distancing doc yeah i think we have to i mean i i think i almost kind of feel like patients expect that of us and it put us not put me back on that slide. i blew away your slide yeah. there sorry about that back to back That's to where right. Good. All right. I don't think I have control anymore, Dave. Cool. So when we maximize efficiency without compromising care, and what's what's you know for for me the way I practice, um, you know I, I see a tremendous amount of patients in a short period of time, um, and not for any other reason uh, except I want to do exactly what this says: maximize my efficiency. You know, if we can all kind of like think about it, if you you see 30 or 40 patients a day. And if you were able to knock off two, three, four minutes per exam, I mean, that's enough time to maybe just do a whole other patient or a whole other exam. You know, years ago, my son, um, who's now 20, um, when he was coming into my practice and he was sitting there and I would pop out, go see a patient, come back. And he's like, what are you doing? I go, well, I just saw the patient. He's like, you were in there for like four minutes, dad. And I'm like, yeah. And He's no math whiz, but he's like, so you basically spend, I don't know, 160 minutes a day in the clinic, and then what do you do the rest of the time? And I'm like, it's called maximizing efficiency, son, which is why somehow I think he wants to become an optometrist. We'll see. But if you're doing a digital phoropter where all components of the refraction are seamlessly connected, I walk into my lane. I told you that I have an auto lensometer. I have an auto refractor. That is already in the phoropter. And literally I can toggle between those and Dave will kind of show you some of the, the ins and outs of that, which makes it just really absolutely incredible for me. And more importantly, the acuity chart is connected to my phoropter, not per se on the phoropter, but on the control panel that I'm using, I'm able to basically adjust everything at a, it, literally a, at a fingertip. Um, something I, I, I've also done is I've automized it or customized it so that I can walk in and I always like to start my patients around 2070, 2050, 2060, and I have it pre-programmed so that when I'm doing a refraction, I start at those numbers. I can isolate the numbers, I can change up the, the um, optotypes if I want to, but what's really nice is that to me, I'm not fumbling around, I'm not maneuvering for it. 
you know, when a patient says to me, well, how does that compare to my previous glasses? Or how does that, you know, uh, compare to um, like an ad or if I'm adding prism, it literally is a, a hit of a button, which optimizes the efficiency that I'm doing with my patients. So I, I'm talking to patients more, I'm looking at them more, but I'm not really spent time doing, you know, our, our, our spinning and grinning or the better one, better two. Dave, you wanna to go to that next slide? Great. So to me, what's really essential, I think, in all of this is that connectivity, you know, working together, you know, the, the pre-test data. And, and I'm, I'm shameless. I work with technicians. Um, I've taught them how to kind of do a, a, a rough uh, refraction, if you will. But again, I won't let a patient leave unless I do it myself, you know. And so for they, for my technicians, they like certain optotypes. They like to work kind of like with a larger view of the visual acuity, or excuse me, of the uh, Snellen chart. I like to use less. One of the technicians I work with, she likes to work with the tumbling ease. I don't know why. So it's literally a hit of a button for her. The tumbling ease come up, and she's able to kind of do that. Another tech I use is, likes to do a red-green duochrome. And so we have that there too. Unlike coming in and kind of changing the 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 uh, parameters, if you will. We don't, in my practice, utilize EMR, which kind of sounds from an efficiency standpoint, sounds ridiculous. Um, but I work with a surgeon who is just so accustomed to not changing things. And what's really interesting to me is we're sitting here talking about exciting changes in our profession. And I've always felt that optometry adapts to change just a little bit quicker than ophthalmology. Um, and in our practice, staying in paper, he just, it's, it's like people who like to hold a book versus people who are comfortable now with the tablet. I'm a tablet guy. He's a hold the paper book, but you can transfer all of that information, the visual acuity, the correction, the lensometry, everything across in there, and it's done wireless. It's done through Bluetooth. And I will say that the, the elimination of the transcription errors has probably been one of the, the nicest things for me. Because in our practice, we do things in a plus cylinder form. And a lot of the technicians have come from an optometric practice where it's a minus cylinder form. And the transposition or putting things in, they'll read the glasses, they'll put it in minus cylinder form lensometer. And then they don't realize that when they don't change it. And so for me, having all of that information on there has really helped to kind of elucidate some of those concerns or changes. Next slide, D. You're still in control, Mark. It's just I a am? little late. Yeah, with the- Oh, the... I, oop, too fast, too fast, too fast. So I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I love the look of this practice. This is Dr. Justin Verone and Dr. Benjamin Peters. I believe they're in Rochester. So in a couple months, you won't even see that. It's just gonna be covered with white snow, um, but you might still see that eyesight door. And I, you know, I'm sure some of the attendees on here have a phenomenal looking practice and it sets you, it differentiates you. I mean, one of the things that when we talk about as being, you know, an independent doctor of optometry, or even if you're in a, uh, a group practice, is we want to give our patients a reason to come see us. You know, I often talk about the fact that, you know, getting a great refraction is only as good as like the ocular surface. So, you know, when you differentiate yourself by evaluating and treating the ocular surface, you know, then your patients are going to appreciate that. I feel, as I've already said before, is that when you exceed these expectations and elevate the patient experience, then they are more inclined to send friends in, have your patients come back here. More importantly, in our practice, we have actually had patients call, make appointments, because their friends and family have told them that if you're gonna get an eye exam, you have to come here. And a large part of the reason why is what I said to you a few minutes ago, which is that the digital and the technology that we use in our practice sets ourselves aside. And you know, I, I think one of the most uh, cherishing things I've heard from patients is when they say, you know what, how come my other doctor didn't do this? Or wow, I feel like I stepped in you know, to, to a time machine. So those positive experiences translate into patient referrals, which basically translates into, you know, let's be honest, more sales, but patient retention and patient happiness, which I think is really critical for all of us. 
especially if you're looking for those clicks, those online reviews, if you will, and customer retention. I feel like I'm lagged here, Dave. Yeah, there's there's a bit of a lag time. We got it. So, you know, for all of us too, you know, when we start thinking about, you know, working as long as we do and how often we're in the in the lane there, uh, I think, you know, ergonomics is important to improve posture, eliminating back pain, reducing fatigue. You know, when you're facing your patients while doing the digital for opter. And so you can look here at this picture. I mean, this literally is, is a perfect example of how you're eye to eye with your patients. And one of the things that I've always kind of found, especially when you're doing a, um, when we're doing our uh, uh, refraction is that standing off to the side, we're at an angle, we can't be in front of them. Here, I actually get to look at the patient if I want to, and I can do it at a distance. The nicer thing too, is that I can actually see, I watch to see if they're blinking. I like to see if they're pulling away, if they're staying in the phoropter and, and uh, we noticed too that there's a there's a little bit of a headrest that keeps them in there, but over time, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, we do a lot of things that are not great for us posturally, and so anything we can do to improve that is going to be better. And you also get to basically your patients are are basically looking at you, watching you do this, and it's it's I don't know, like for for lack of a better way, I just it's it's really impressive to me when I when I. Uh, I can do this. I don't know how many of you guys um, out there still feel like, you know, you're when we're bent down or we're off to the side, I oftentimes I'll have to look. I mean, I do this by feel sometimes, you know, when I'm using my standard for opter, I feel like it's kind of like, I think I'm there. I don't know where I am, but this illuminated uh, keypad here really gives me a good indicator as to what I'm doing and where I'm at. I kind of feel like I keep hitting this here. So, we mentioned before at the very beginning is that there's that quick comparison. You know, here's a patient sitting behind the, our digital phoropter. I can show them the subjective. I can show them lensometry by one click, even if it's a small difference. I mean, you know, especially like a quarter diopter. Now, in, in my practice, that's a big difference. I mean, because these are patients who, you know, uh, the difference might be between wanting to have surgery and not wanting to have surgery. We do a lot of keratoconic patients in our practice as well. And what's really, really impressive to me is when you get into the higher amounts of cylinder, the higher amounts of refraction, and patients are like, well, you know, I feel like my vision's really reduced. And to be able to show them where they were, where they're at, um, it just, it's, it's, it's impressive. You see the prism bars that are off to the side there. Those prism can actually, they come down and we can toggle them in. And so you can toggle the prism in and out like you're doing a binocular balance. And something else, and I know Dave is gonna tell you, but I don't care, is that if you look at this, this digital phoropter, it is so thin. I mean, this is not a big bulky you know, device. Everything is housed in there so nicely and so quietly. It's really, really impressive. So you get this instantaneous refraction, and we can compare it with our patients. Um, and we've seen sales of our, our, our optical, as I said, go up, um, basically because I'm able to kind of demonstrate to them the differences that they get with that small amount of correction. Here's that customization and consistency. I, I mentioned before, in our practice, we do minus and plus. The minus basically um, is when they're utilizing that uh, uh, quick check so I can just kind of make a quick conversion. We can program refractant sequences. And this is always nice because we have a lot of different um, technicians that come to the practice. And so it makes it easy, especially when you start doing like the smart cylinder where it's basically adaptive and it basically makes it easier for them to be able to find the axis because it toggles it. And then also when you're doing the cross cylinder, you know, to get in for the, their, their prescription, um, we can copy this to additional digital phoropters. And then, as, as I said before, programming the acuity chart. When I do my binocular balance, I always like to show them something like a 2025, a 2030. And so I literally can just have it already pre-programmed. I hit it up there. Something else that I just love is that when patients pretend like they know the letters that they've already kind of like memorized it, I hit a button and it changes all the optotypes. Or better yet, I could single one letter down for those patients that I feel like, 
you know, they're just like going so slow. So I could do a line of letters or I can do an individual letter, especially when you're doing like a horizontal or a vertical phorias, it makes it just a, a lot more comfortable and a lot easier for these patients. I'm waiting for my next, ooh, ooh, we got one coming up. So keeping that safe distance, you know, it, it, implementing the digital propter really kind of was easy for us. Um, you know, we're able to basically walk into a lane and this is the lane that we use sincerely for like our VIP patients. But for patients that come in and they have a, a general concern, we've had patients that have come in and basically said to us, this is the first appointment I've been into or I haven't been to an eye clinic in a long time. And if you look at the picture to the right, you know, something you can see on there is you can see the little, um, it's like a shield, a uh, breath shield that we have hanging down there. Um, we wear masks, we ask our patients to wear masks, but one of the challenges that we have, especially when you're doing a refraction, um, is that patients um, fog things up. And I'm gonna show you that in a couple of seconds. And so especially now, and I do not think that masks are going away, people. I really don't. I mean, if you guys do, Dave and I were having a discussion offline. Dave, Dave thinks that things might be getting better. He's optimistic. I don't. I think that we're going to be wearing masks for a while. And to be quite honest with you and sincere with you, I almost kind of feel like in our medical practice, we may continue to do it because we want to instill this confidence in our patients. And so having that little bit of a, that breath shield, it also means that when I take the mask off, the patient feels comfortable. I keep mine on, but I am literally six feet away from them. Um, so we have this distance. You can add some extra cables if you needed to make it go a little bit further. But the truth of the matter is, is that we keep that, that safe distance by doing the phoropter. And there's no other way to do it because arm's length with a normal, you know, uh, average phoropter, it just isn't going to work. So let's, let's ask another question, Dave. All right, Doc, we can launch the second poll question here, which is going to be, have you added a breath shield to your phoropter for refractions? Give everybody a minute to respond to that. A lot of responses coming in really fast. Looks like it's settling around 60% yes. So, well, not everybody's picked one of these up yet but uh, about 60% of the audience has. I think that I, I think anything you can do to help kind of create a, a CDC guidelines safe distance for your patients just kind of makes them feel comfortable. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I have patients that will come in and they'll say things like, oh, we don't need a mask, doc, or you don't need that. But to me, I say, you know what? I'm doing this for you. You know what? I, I want that barrier for you. So, you know, even if it's, you don't want to do it for me, of course, I don't say that, but I'm thinking it, I'm doing it for you. So, telerefraction ready. Now, we talked before about tele, teleoptometry. And one of the things that we haven't been able to do in our practice is, is if you think about being able to do a refraction remotely, you know, having a digital ferropter basically allows us to do that. You know, there was those companies that came out with their, you know, get on the internet and, you know, do this, this elaborate kind of like uh, examination, which really wasn't an exam. Well, you can see on our slide here that basically the FDA issued a recall of these, whether it be alternative or visibility in 2019, which is fine, because the reality is that was never truly done by a doctor of optometry. It wasn't, you know, uh, that, that acumen that we talked about before wasn't utilized during these evaluations because that's really what they were. But a lot of manufacturers now are offering solutions and providing a personalized care through remotely co controlled proctors. Think about it. I mean, imagine that little keypad I just showed you. And if that was attached to the web to, let's say, I don't know, you know, the, the cloud that could then connect to a phoropter, which is some miles away, you could you could basically do the exact same thing that you're doing six feet away. You could do that 600 yards or maybe you know 10, 20 miles or even across the country to be able to to refract them across an office or across the globe. I mean that that visualization to me is just it's it's so impressive. 
I mean, part of the reason why is how many times have you had a patient call up and say they lost their contacts or, hey, can you, and to be able to just say, look, you know what, I haven't seen you in so long, but let's, you know, can I get you to go to this place, you know, maybe meet up with a technician who then can connect us to the Foropter, or better yet, they go to your office and you can be able to do this remotely. I mean, I just think that the ability to have telerefraction is going to just add such a, a it's gonna add an element to our, our ability to re, uh, examine patients that we've never been able to have before. What's interesting to me too is that, you know, we don't just use refractions to give our patients prescription for glasses or contacts. A refraction is really from a medical standpoint is to be able to discern whether or not our patients have something that's prohibiting them from getting the best possible vision. You know, it's a great way to kind of evaluate if somebody has cataracts or an opacity or something going on in their retina. And we all know this. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And a lot of patients will come in and say, well, I don't want glasses. And I go, well, I'm not doing this for your glasses. I'm doing this to see what the capability is of your vision. And so think about, you know, doing that remotely. To me, that just adds even another greater element to this digital age that we're all gonna be in. And we're, we're doing it now. And then combine it with the CDC and this, you know, health-related issue, it just really opens up a great, great opportunity for all of us. So that's another question, Dave. Yeah, last, the last poll question here. So the last one is, how have you educated your patient base of the changes within your practice due to COVID-19? And you can, you can check all that apply on this one. So what are you using to educate your patients during this time? Let's see. Check. So, there we go. Check. A lot of social yeah. media, uh, social yep. media and email are in a are in a race for it. Uh, email just jumped ahead, but they're neck and neck, and a lot of people using phone calls too. Um, yeah, so yeah, about sixty percent of people using social media, seventy percent using email communication, seventy percent using phone calls, and a little smattering of direct mail and videos. So that's really really. Where, good does, where does text messages go? I would put. Yeah, it's not all that there. phone calls. Yeah, we should yeah, have. We, we do a lot of, yeah, we do a lot of text messaging. And then, then don't forget ESP. Some people have a really strong connection with their patients. Yes, they do. Not me. Not me. Not at all. Not even remotely. I wish I did. So we just talked about something that sounds really kind of like out there, but it's not people. It's, it's here. You know, a couple of years ago, I did a exam or did a lecture over at uh, Vision Expo. And I talked about, um, my good friend, Henry Bemis. Henry Bemis was, if you ever watched The Twilight Zone, he was Burgess Meredith's character in like 1957, I think it was, um, maybe 1960. And all he wanted to do was read, but he was like an 18 diopter hyperope. And to me, it's like, if we could go back in time, if there was a way that I could, you know, do like a Lovecraft country. And if anybody's watching Love Lovecraft Country on, HBO, it is legit. If you could go back in the universe to be able to help Mr. Bemis, and I, I envisioned using something like this, a digital optometrics, where I'm sitting here in the year 20, whatever it was, 17, and Mr. Bemis is in 1957, and he could walk into a practice where there's a technician that basically does a lensometry, and they do an auto refraction. They then input that into the foropter, so now there's both of those in the foropter. They could do a fundus photography and even like set up a video slit lamp. I'm sitting somewhere else, like in my lane with monitors sitting here. And I am getting that image transmitted to me. There's a camera that basically shows me the patient. We have one-on-one -on -one talking and I'm doing their refraction. The technician in my practice does it anyway. So all I'm gonna do is walk in and basically just on this digital, optometric platform is be the doctor that's going to come in and refine that. I'm going to look at those, you know, like an optos almost. I'm going to look at the back of the eye and see if I see any signs of any retinopathy or any other concerns, any AV nicking. You know, I'm going to look at the optic nerve and see if there's any changes. If we're able to do an ORA, I'm going to look at their hysteresis. And if there's a family history, I'm going to be able to discern whether or not this is somebody who needs to be referred somewhere else. But we're able to basically do a digital exam, which is approved by the American Academy of Optometry as a full exam. 
And to me, digital optometrics and teleoptometry is, is something that just, I, I really foresee us doing this. I told you, I mentioned before that we do um, the, uh, at most of the athletes in town. We have a clinic for the, at the Suns at their stadium. And we talked before about setting up a, like a digital optometric um, lane in there. So when they have a problem, you know, the, whatever the doctors are, that we could teach a technician to be able to set them up. And oftentimes some of these guys, you know, they want exams, they don't want to come in, they're at practice. So we kind of talked about how could we integrate this into something high tech like that, that our athletes really expect. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, I just, I can't emphasize enough how I think the technology is really impressive. Now, I don't know if these are going to play or not, but I think I have to, I think I have to launch the video for you, Mark. So the, those are just pictures there, but I can, uh, let me see. You don't have to, you don't Here's have to. Uh, boom. Did it work? Hey, that's me. No. Oh, wait, maybe. Let's see. All right, Ms. Froberg slash Blumenstein. Smile's 93 right there. Nothing. I can't see it. It's, what do you mean? It's hazy. I can't. I can't see anything. What if I do this? A little, a little bigger. No. What do you mean no? I, I mean, can't. I can't see it. How, okay. How about this? I mean, it's bigger, but it's still really hazy. I, do you know what you're doing? What do you mean, do I know what I'm doing? I mean, don't your technicians usually do you know this what? part? You know what? Now you're starting to get a little bit insulting, okay? Uh, for crying out loud, the whole thing's fogged up. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> I didn't do it. I'm muted. Ooh, you're back. back. You should be back. Yeah, so that was... That was uh, my interpretation of what I kind of have been going through with the vid. Um, that right there was my wife and she wasn't pretending. She really did ask if one of the technicians could actually come in and, and do the exam. And I'm like, you're a hater. I was really just trying to emphasize a couple of things here is, you know, the way we have our lane set up. Um, I normally usually have it on a, a table. And so I'm facing the patient. I moved it out to the side here because I, I wanted you to get the experience that what we're seeing, especially when we're doing just a, a regular foropter, is that not having a mask on, being able to sit in front of them, patients are going to get a, a much better experience. You know, I, I was able to kind of like demonstrate to her through the use of technology, even though she didn't believe me or not. But I think one of the things that I will share with you that has been the, the most impressive for me is just having the ease to be able to walk in, hit a couple buttons, and know that it's like where exactly I need to be. I told you we do a lot of keratoconic patients, and not having to put in, you know, the the extra three diopters of cylinder, or walking into a lane where it's already it somebody took it out, you know, and so I'm like, Ugh, for crying out loud, I need to put it back in, and try to figure those things out. It's been an absolutely easy transition in our practice, and and especially for me. This I told you before was part of a, a video I did to try to talk talk to my wife into uh, uh, getting surgery done just because I think she needs it. But Dave, we we, we love it. Um, you know, for me, it's it's probably one of the best things we've ever put in our practice behind the ORA. I mean, I love my ORA as well, the ocular response analyzer. But uh, if you want to pick it up from here, go for it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumenstein. Wonderful presentation. Entertaining as always. Um, oh, you say that. Unfortunately, I think I just turned my webcam back on so you can see me again. And I'm just going to yeah. wrap up. A couple of people asked some questions, so I may direct a few of those to you, Dr. Blumenstein. I may answer a few of them myself here. Uh, you, um, you were correct when you mentioned that the Feropter is uh, trademarked. Um, that, that trademark belongs to Reichert. So, we, in, we technically invented the Feropter, and that name goes all the way back to the uh, early 1920s. Um, and uh, what we're, you missed the mark by about uh, 60 miles. We're in Buffalo, not in Rochester. Uh, ah, another, so close. Another great Western New York town right down the road. And you were right, Dr. Peters and Dr. Verone's practice uh, eyesight is in Rochester. 
So, uh, but uh, yeah, we have a very strong heritage in refraction and uh, that stems from our legendary Ultramatic RX Master Foropter that everybody on this call has, has used. Um, and um, uh, these, these instruments, uh, actually somebody asked the question, where are these made? They are made in Buffalo, New York, USA, where our headquarters is. Um, and we don't have the green and the, and the pink and whatnot colors like we had back in the, back in the 60s, but we do have many different options when it comes to foropters, manual foropters, illuminated foropters, and a couple of different models of digital um, foropters uh, that we can offer to you. Uh, the, uh, somebody asked the question uh, during the call, what are some of the advantages of the VRX uh, over some of the competition? Dr. Blumenstein mentioned it early in the presentation that the foropter head, the foropter VRX head is so small uh, and, and he mentioned how important that is for him to look at the patient, see facial expressions, tell if they're blinking, tell if they're positioned properly behind the instrument. And you can see that here in the upper left. It's a very, very small uh, uh, footprint uh, and it has a asymmetrical height adjustment knob, which some of the manual, or rather the auto foropters out there on the market do not have. Dr. Blumenstein also mentioned the retractable prisms. That's one of the things that gives this particular device the ability to be so thin and to eliminate that chunky, thick tunnel vision um, uh, auto foropter of yesteryear. Uh, those prisms are motorized and they slide in only when you're going to use prism during a refraction. The lens exchange in the Foropter VRX is another competitive advantage of this instrument. Super fast and super quiet. Your patients will be amazed uh, at how silent this instrument is as you're flipping through the lenses. The hardware is superior. Uh, you, you go ahead and um, when trade shows come back, you go ahead and walk around the exhibit hall and wrap on these things with your, with your knuckles and you will feel the quality in the uh, metal parts and heavy duty components of the Foropter VRX. We have a, a, a red green split cross cylinder lens. Uh, this is great for the people who can never decide what's better one or two when you're viewing the astigmatic dial. Um, that lens permits patients to see one and two at the same time because of the split design of the lens. And they can tell you the red side or the green side of the lens is their preference. Uh, so that's a nice feature as well. And another thing that's unique about the VRX is that it plays well with others. Uh, many other brands of automated instruments on the market only connect to um, their own uh, brand. We connect with pretty much any um, autorefractor, lensometer, and a couple of different manufacturers of uh, acuity charts out there as well. So if you have a manuf another manufacturer's autorefractor and you're in love with it, and you want to buy a Foropter VRX from Rikert, you don't have to buy a new autorefractor. You don't have to buy a new lensometer if you're already happy with what you have in your office. That also means you don't have to lay out as much cash when you're ready to make the, the step up to uh, automated Foropter. Uh, the control panel very logically laid out. Uh, you can use touch screen, you can use the buttons, uh, however you prefer to navigate your way around the system, super intuitive. And as I mentioned, really, really robust quality uh, and when you buy a Foropter VRX, you get installation and training from Riker clinical application specialists. So these are all the things that make the Foropter VRX um, a unique and, and a superior instrument. And we believe that the, the entire experience um, is, is uh, superior. Um, I, Dave, you had mentioned it before about the controller. And I guess I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't emphasize enough. It's literally you have your hand on there. And everything on I me, mean, the buttons are large, like right, both, left, you know, you spin the dial, you can touch the screen. You literally, you know, you don't have to move very much. And it's, it's when you say intuitive, it's beyond intuitive. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's extremely logical um, and w which makes it really nice too. Um, so I just want to- That's great. That's good feedback. We're glad to hear that. You know, when we launched this instrument um, a number of years ago now, we, we, we spent a couple of years developing this, this product and we spent a lot of time with optometrists, um, you know, helping us develop the, the layout of the user interface, making sure that we had this right. And uh, all the feedback we've received has been very, very positive. People like the control panel. Uh, we got a question that just came in, and, and I guess we could probably answer this one two different ways. Somebody asked, 
who cleans the instrument. I suppose we could also ask, how do we clean the instrument? And, and Mark, I guess um, the, the question it could be considered in two different ways. How do you clean it every day? And then maybe I'll answer the question about how would we clean this if it needed to be sent in for service? Well, we, we clean it just like we clean every other piece of equipment in our practice. Between every patient, um, we're cleaning off the headrest, we clean off the outside of it, um, and we clean up the bar. And so if you're asking from that perspective, um, that's how we do it. But in, gosh, how many years I've had it, um, we've never had any issues with dust or dirt inside the propter. So we have never had to have that as an issue. Yep, it's a fully sealed unit. These are actually built in a clean room at our factory and the unit is completely sealed. So there shouldn't be any opportunity for dust or any other sorts of contamination or kids fingerprints or anything else to get inside this unit. So you really, there really should be no reason to send this back for, you know, your annual cleaning or every couple year cleaning like you may with a manual foropter. And you can wipe this instrument down uh, in between patients with a variety of different uh, disinfectants and wipes. The last thing I wanted to tell you about is that we have this cool uh, opportunity for doing virtual demos, and we actually had this before COVID, so we feel very proud of ourselves for this. But down there in the bottom right of my screen, you can see one of our application specialists, Kristen Fisher. She's really good at refractions. So we can, we can connect with you via an application, kind of like what we're on here tonight, and, and we can uh, walk you through using a Foropter VRX show you the control panel, show you the chart, show you what's happening on the Foropter all virtually and answer your questions uh, at a time that's convenient for you. We've got a number of people that work for us, application specialists and tech support people in our company that have the capability and know how to do this. So we can be very flexible to meet your uh, needs if you wanna take a virtual test drive of the Foropter VRX. Um, you know, Dave, you, there's a couple things you didn't mention. Like one of the, some of, some of the cooler stuff, like when, when you pull down the near point rod, it automatically illuminates um, the, the near point. And, and, and these are just little things, but it's like, when I do that, it pays like, ooh, or the fact that you can do a PD check. So literally, you know, there's a button on the control panel, I'll hit PD and basically I'll be able to align it. And you also mentioned about the asymmetry, um, you know, for some patients that are just not quite symmetrical, you can do an asymmetrical assessment with that. So it, it's it's the little things to me. They're also, you know, you're always concerned about doing a refraction and you want to make sure that the working distance is fine. If the patient starts falling back, and I get that all the time, I'll have patients, you know, in a traditional foropter say something like, oh, oh, if I get closer, I can see better. One of the things that's really nice is that that headrest will tell you if the patient is off the headrest. So it's just, a, I'm not sure how much pressure they have to put on it, but basically it tells you that they're aligned when they fall back, it says headrest, you know, I'll be, oh, you're, you're not in the headrest, get back in there. So just little features like that, that you just would never get in your standard Riker for Opter. Makes it really nice. I just had one, one well, one person, he, uh, texted in and said, love to sign up for a virtual demo, another person actually, and then somebody asked if there's any video tutorials available. I'm, I'm quite sure we have some video materials uh, that we could send to you and, or, or put on a Google Drive or something for you to download, so we will uh, we'll get back to you on that. Have your, have your contact information here. Um, I want to remind everybody, well, first of all, in summary, um, if there's no more questions coming in, you know, what we talked about here tonight, I think Dr. Blumenstein did a great job um, uh, talking about his experience with this device and his practice and all the things that it enables him to do. We could sum it up in, in, in three words, outdo your competition. You know, this will give you the opportunity to create a experience for your patients that they will be wowed by whether you're using it uh, uh, standalone or whether you're using it in combination with the digital optometric service that Dr. Blumenstein talked about. Um, it will improve your practice efficiency, whether that enables you to see more patients or whether that enables you to spend time doing more medical with your patients because your refractions are done quicker uh, or whether your techs can handle the refraction because you've got a program built into it. All of those things are advantages of this technology. Um, 
and you can maintain a safe environment. You know, that's not, not a bullet point that we would have had on this slide last year, but it sure is now. Uh, so whether you're doing it from six feet with the control panel or from 25 feet with an extension cable that we have available, or whether you're using digital optometrics and doing it from your home or using a, a refractionist at digital optometrics to conduct your exams for you, which you can do uh, so that you can see patients on after hours or on days that you're not normally open or when your office is closed while you're on vacation, all those things are possible. Uh, we have a couple more webinars coming up in our fall learning series here that we're kind of you doing to, to uh, replace the trade shows that we would normally be having this time of year. We've got a couple of um, uh, webinars on Thursday, October 2nd, one at 11 and one at 8 Eastern time with Felipe Medeiros and Devinder Grover talking about a device that Dr. Blumenstein mentioned two or three times tonight, the ocular response analyzer. If you measure intraocular pressure in your practice and if you do any glaucoma in your practice, you're going to want to turn in, uh, tune into this one. And the same could be said for our, our last uh, in the series on October 29th. Um, with Dr. Singh, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, and a fantastic uh, 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 cataract and glaucoma specialist in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He's going to be talking about one of the many tonometers he uses in his practice, the Tano Pen, and um, how that is uh, convenient and 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 suitable for today's evolving practice environment. So you can go to passionateabouticare.com/remote-learning uh, to sign up for these um, webinars. Somebody asked if we'll receive a recording of the webinar. We have recorded this webinar and we will make it available after. And then somebody said, thank you so much. And that's what I wanna to say to all of you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everybody spending some time with us this evening. Um, we we uh, look forward to seeing you in person at, uh, at some of the trade shows next year when hopefully things get back to being a little bit more normal. Until then, we'll see you in the cloud and see you on a virtual VRX demo sometime soon. Thanks a lot for spending some time with us this evening. Take care. Be safe, everybody.